are gonna talk about equine asthma, a topic that is near and dear to our hearts, especially this time of year, I would say. We really enjoy spending a lot of quality time with asthma this time of year, so we're gonna talk about it tonight. Uh, for those of you just joining us, you do have to comment down below to get entered for the giveaways. There are three of them. Comment below to get entered for the three giveaways. Uh, and we will be randomly drawing for those after each of our sections tonight. Uh, and wellness sign up is starting. So Dr. York is gonna start us off with the causes of equine asthma. So there we go. Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Elizabeth York and I'm excited to talk about asthma. We've been seeing it a lot this summer, like Dr. Latcher said, so we definitely wanna put some education in your hands so you can uh, know what to do if your horse shows the symptoms and, and how to uh, get him treated. So equine asthma is a spectrum of inflammatory diseases of the lungs of horses that includes several different uh, disease processes uh, that have different names we've talked about over time. You may have heard of heaves, you may have heard of COPD, RAO, or recurrent airway obstruction. You may have heard of inflammatory airway disease. These are all similar disease processes on the continuum that is, uh, that is equine asthma. So we're gonna talk mostly about the, just the term equine asthma uh, because these are all similar processes. So what these uh, different disease processes have in common is that they cause airway uh, narrowing or bronchoconstriction, they cause excessive mucus secretion in the airways, and they cause obstruction to airflow of varying severity. So what does it look like if your horse has an equine asthma episode? Well, it can range from just a minor amount of uh, reduction in performance. Your horse is not able to, to run uh, or uh, compete as well as you expect him to, uh, to something where the horse isn't even comfortable living in the pasture, so poor quality of life. Uh, it may look like fast or labored breathing, increased effort to breathe, uh, coughing, wheezing from the lungs, nostril flare, uh, and sometimes white uh, mucoid nasal discharge. Some horses that have uh, had this uh, problem for quite a while and uh, with increased severity have what's called a heave line. You can see in the, in the picture to the right, uh, increased abdominal musculature from the effort that's um, uh, placed in, in the effort of, of breathing for these horses. And horses that have had this for a while can actually become quite thin. They use a lot of calories just for the effort of breathing and they spend more time focusing on just drawing a breath than they do actually wanting to graze. So we'll talk a little bit about a couple of the major categories in equine asthma. And uh, the first is inflammatory airway disease. And then we'll talk about RAO or heaves, uh, something we see a little bit more commonly in multiple ages of horses. Uh, now IAED is something that uh, can be seen in any age horse, but a lot of times it's the younger horses that'll have it. And one of the things that differentiates it from heaves or RAO is that it's less severe. So horses may be quite normal looking at rest and it's something you notice more when they're actually performing that they do have a problem. Um, they may not actually have an allergy to something in the air. It may be a normal horse without a specific allergy that's just reacting to uh, en environmental toxins such as mold or fungus or endotoxins in the air, uh, though the horse doesn't naturally have a problem with an allergy himself. Uh, IAD horses don't necessarily go on to develop heaves uh, later in life. It's not necessarily a continuum between RA or IAD and RAO. So it's important to remember that IAD horses uh, may be cured and may not go on to have other problems later on. RAO, on the other hand, is, is a little bit more severe generally. It tends to be something that horses, once they have it, they'll continue living with it. Um, they often do have a clear allergic component, uh, especially when more severe. And this is usually something uh, seen in horses that are older than six or seven years old. So there's two forms when we talk about equine asthma, uh, one of which is associated with indoor environments, which is more uh, poorly ventilated barns, uh, dusty or molding hay or dusty bedding. Uh, now this tends to be something seen more often in the northern states, places where horses spend a lot more time in interior environments, uh, so, so barns that are closed up in the winter. Uh, on the other hand, we in Florida see a lot of summer pasture associated equine asthma. Uh, so that's something that's seen around the southeast, uh, predominantly Georgia, Louisiana, Florida, and we see a lot of it here, uh, especially seasonally from uh, mid to, to late spring all the way through the fall. Uh, we see a lot during the summer, we've seen a lot now, even though uh, technically we're heading into fall, but it's still, of course, quite warm here. So summer pasture-associated equine asthma is seen mostly on the horses that are uh, out in pasture, usually more than 12 hours. 
Um, they are exposed to particles such as mold spores and pollens, although we don't know specifically what pollens. Uh, some horses may have allergy to certain types of pollens. There may be a genetic predisposition. Uh, some quarter horses and paints are overrepresented in the numbers of horses with RAO or heaves. Uh, however, those also may just be the horses that are spending more time on pasture, so that's not been definitively linked. Um, now, it's also exacerbated, though not necessarily caused, by environmental conditions such as increased temperature and humidity. So those things make it worse, but those aren't the primary causes. So what else besides heaves could it be? You see your horse having some increased uh, respiratory effort, uh, trouble breathing, wheezing, coughing. Uh, you're not necessarily guaranteed to be looking at asthma. Uh, there's several other things that it could be, and it's really, really important to determine what you're treating. Don't just go find a medicine and give your horse uh, you know, something because you think heaves is common. Uh, it's, it's very important that we're treating appropriately because some of the other diseases are infectious type diseases. Bacteria and viruses cause, uh, cause infections. Uh, parasites can cause infections, and there's other types of upper airway disease. And one medicine may, may help uh, bacterial infection and not be good for RAO or heaves, uh, and something you might give for uh, asthma or heaves can be really bad for a bacterial infection. So uh, call your veterinarian if you have concerns about horse, how your horse is breathing, and determine what you're treating before you treat. Um, so I'm going to go on and talk to you guys about diagnosing heaves, asthma, REO, IED, all of those fun things that we kind of group into this asthma, um, equine asthma term. Um, so basically, you guys are going to call the clinic. You're going to see your horse is having some trouble breathing, so you're going to call the clinic. They're going to set up for us to come out and look at your horse. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to observe your horse probably from afar. Most of the time we see these horses who are having... Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, most of the time, though, what we're going to see is these horses who are having trouble breathing. They're going to be standing. Their head's going to be down. They're going to just be kind of not really super responsive. They're going to seem like they're just not happy about life. They're going to have the heave line, like Dr. York pointed out, you see here, from that extra abdominal effort. Um, and they're basically, they're working their abs a lot, but not really in a good way. We were kind of talking about and joking earlier, maybe we're going to start breathing really heavy, so maybe we get abs. I don't think it's going to work like that, but, you know, we might try. Um, so then we're actually going to come up and, and look at your horse. We're going to check their mucous membrane color. So you're going to see us look in their mouth. We want that to be nice and light pink. We're going to make sure that their gums are, are moist and that they're not dehydrated. We're going to listen to them. We're going to get their heart rate. As you guys have already seen in one of our previous, um, you know, vitals uh, seminars, we want their heart rate to be kind of below 40. Um, sometimes these guys, they can have a little bit of an elevated heart rate because they're a little bit stressed out, or if, if you bring them here to the clinic, they can get a little bit, you know, kind of excited. But for the most part, we want our heart rate to be below 40 in a horse. We're going to take their temperature. Sometimes if they have an infectious cause that's causing them to have these, this trouble breathing, their temperature might be elevated. What's the normal temperature on a horse? Normally we would, you know, let you guys answer that. But anyways. Below 101.5 um, is going to be the normal temperature on a horse, above about 99. Um, if it's in the middle of the summer and it's 110 degrees out and they're a little bit higher than that, you know, we take that into consideration as well. Then the biggest part of our examination for a horse that may have asthma is going to be listening to their lungs. We're going to take the time to get a respiratory rate. Their respiratory rate is often going to be very high. Normally, we want to see a respiratory rate in the low teens, you know, maybe pushing into the 20s, but usually in the low teens that we want to see a respiratory rate. These guys are going to have respiratory rates 40 to 60, which is just, you know, super, super high, and they're having such a hard time getting that oxygen in and out. Um, we're going to listen to their lung sounds. They're going to have crackles, which kind of sounds like a, a chip bag, kind of crinkling. Um, they're going to have wheezes, which sounds like a little bit of a whistle. Um, sometimes they'll have rubs, but that's a little bit less common. Um, but this is something that we really, really listen for for these um, asthma horses. We may occasionally, if they're a very mild case, do what's called a rebreathing exam, where your horse is going to think that we are absolutely suffocating them to death. We're going to put a bag over their nose and around their mouth, and we're going to make them take deep breaths. We can't, when we go to the doctor, the doctor will say, hey, take a deep breath. We can't do that to your horse. They don't listen. They don't seem to understand what it means to take a deep breath. We good? Keep going? Okay. Um, 
But anyways, so we put a bag over their nose and around their mouth and they take big deep breaths and then we take it off. And when we take it off, what happens is they can take that deep breath and we can sometimes enhance these sounds that we don't really want to hear but we need to hear so we know what we're diagnosing. Um, after the physical exam, there's several different things that we can do. Um, one being a bronchoalveolar lavage, or BAL for short. short. What this does is this basically we are, your horse thinks we're trying to drown it. We're not, promise. We were doing this for the good of your horse and your horse's lungs are really, really big and they can take a lot of fluid, which I'm gonna explain. Um, but basically what we do is we pass a specific tube up your horse's nose, down its trachea and into its lungs where we then place um, a large amount of sterile saline through the tube into the lungs. We then take all of that saline back. And what we do with that is we get a sample, um, which you'll see this is kind of what it looks like here. Uh, and what a good sample looks like, it has this white foam kind of at the top here. It's called surfactant. We really, really want to see that when we get our sample back. It means we've got a really good sample. And we make what's called a cytology, which basically we then look at and it's on a slide, um, we stain it and we look at it for different types of cells. And what we are looking for is normal cells and abnormal cells. We look for macrophages, lymphocytes, neutrophils, mast cells, and eosinophils. Macrophages and lymphocytes, we want to see. Those are the normal cells that we would see in your horse's lung kind of capacity. They're the good guys. They are there for um, immune support. If you get bacteria, you know, just breathe in, or your horse is breathing in bacteria, they're there to fight that off. We don't usually see neutrophils on a normal horse. That's gonna be, they're gonna be there if they have something infectious, a bacteria, uh, fungal, some sort of infection like that. Mast cells and eosinophils are present when we have an allergen. So if they're, like Dr. York was talking about, the pasture-associated allergens, mold, um, pollen, et cetera. Um, the thing about a BAL is that it is not, it's very specific. It is specific to the small airways. If we get it, like I said, all the way down to the, to the lungs where we're putting in the fluid. The big thing about this is if we think we have an infectious agent, we don't want to do this because it's not sterile. The tube that we're going up your horse's nose with goes through its nasal cavity. Well, as we all know, our, our, the, na the nose um, filters out all of you know, the bacteria and whatnot. So if we're putting a tube up there, we're gonna get something, some bacteria, which then if we need to culture it to find out what is causing the, an infection, it's gonna be basically false results. Um, so that's, we wanna use this for if we think we have a non-infectious process, IAD, heaves, um, et cetera. If we think we have an infectious reason for your horse's breathing problem, which isn't really what our talk is about, you know, an infectious agent, it, reason isn't going to cause asthma, but if we think, you know, after we see your horse, they have an elevated temperature, they're having trouble breathing, et cetera, and we think there might be like a pneumonia or something going on, we'll do what's called a transtracheal wash. This is a sterile procedure, and it's nonspecific. It's going to get a, a bigger sample of everything that's going on in your horse's entire airway. Again, not something that we're going to do for heaves or asthma, but is something that could be done for some reason if we needed to. Then another test that we could do, which isn't commonly done, and these are, this is done more in cases of inflammatory airway disease in the younger horses, the ones that are very mild, not really coughing, not really breathing heavy when at rest, but maybe some performance issues. Um, and what this test does is it basically, um, we sedate the horse, and we don't, we don't do this here, this would be something that you would do at a referral clinic, but um, they sedate the horse heavily, they, basically put this cute little inhaler on the horse and they also pass a tube into the horse and they force air into your horse's lungs and out of your horse's lungs and they're able to then get a computer measurement. The horse wears a, a monitor around it to get a measurement of how much the horse is able to inhale and expire with each forced um, breath. And with that, they can then just determine how much capacity your horse has to actually breathe appropriately. So basically what the pulmonary function test will do is give us um, an idea of how much your horse's lungs can actually expand and contract and how much they're actually working. 
Um, and that's the, the extent of that. Again, this is not the go-to test. The go-to test for, for asthma or heaves is going to be your BAL and your physical exam. But in a case where we'll go in, we'll, I'll give you guys a little story time um, about me and my personal horse. He actually has um, inflammatory airway disease, and I didn't know it. And I was riding him a couple years ago, and this horse is perfect. Never does anything bad. Never puts a step wrong. And we jumped a little tiny jump. He landed off of that. He bucked me off. I broke my back. Didn't know it at the time. I got back on, started jumping him around again, and I was like, he's not right. We actually end up, ended up doing this pulmonary function test on him because we didn't realize that he had inflammatory airway disease. So these are going to be like your performance you know, problem horses that we'll, that we'll recommend this test for. Um, another thing that we can do, and I do highly recommend this, is endoscopy. So we stick a little camera um, up your horse's nose and down his trachea. What we can do with this is we can look at your horse's upper airway versus his lower airway. So an upper airway exam, we're going to look at um, their, their pharynx and larynx and, and whatnot and make sure that they don't have what's called laryngeal um, hemiplasia, which is where the, the basically everything doesn't work quite right. And that sometimes can cause them to have breathing problems as well and may be the cause of what seems to be heaves but not, might actually be heaves. Um, then after we look at all of that, make sure that's all functioning normally, we will go and we'll look at their actual trachea, which we are these two pictures down here. And when we're looking at these, we can basically do what's called a tracheal mucopus um, grade. Grade one is going to be very mild um, with mucus in the, in the trachea, maybe in one or two locations. Grade two is going to have basically almost the entire length of the trachea, but a very thin um, amount. And then your grade three is going to be like this guy here who's got this thick, really angry, upset trachea with a lot of mucus in there. It can also aid in sample collection. We can find an actual area where there is a lot of mucus to get a sample from. Um, and then it can also help us rule out exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage or in, you know, what you guys would call um, bleeders. So horses that, ra uh, race horses, performance horses, barrel racers that have this tendency to maybe bleed after running, we can rule that out as a cause of, of any problems. Um, finally, we can do blood work as well. Blood work is very non-specific when it comes to heaves. It's not going to tell us, yes, your horse has heaves, no, your horse doesn't have heaves. But it's never a wrong thing to do to have a complete blood cell count, um, which will also give us a fibrinogen, which is an indication of inflammation. Um, uh, chemistry is also a, a good one to have to check all organ function. Um, and then a serum amyloid A and lactate are also going to be in good indications. So blood work, again, never a bad thing to have on hand. Not going to tell us for sure if your horse has heaves, asthma, RAI, REO, or, or inflammatory airway disease, but never a bad thing to have on hand. Um, just just kind of to assess the entire well-being of your horse. Um, can also point out that there could be, an, if there is an infectious cause, uh, blood work would help us identify that as well. Exactly. <laughs> so anyways, hand it over to Dr. Latcher. She'll talk to you guys about treatment. All right. Thank you guys for hanging with us through our technology difficulties tonight. I have no idea what AT&T is doing, but it's not running our internet, that I can tell you. Um, so we're going to head over towards treatment right now. I know there's a bunch of questions on there on treatment, so I'll get to you guys, I promise. Um, sometimes I feel like this would be the best treatment, which would be to put these horses in a bubble um, and have someone behind the bubble pushing it along. I, I, I actually can't believe this is a real picture. And apparently this guy does this with several horses, which I find actually quite impressive. But anyway, horse in a bubble. So our treatment goals are going to be aimed at two different things. And one is going to be reducing that mucus that Dr. Abbott talked about that you would see on the scoping that we would see from our, our diagnostic testing. The other thing is going to be to open the airways. So anyway, when you have asthma, you have mucus as we talked about. You also have bronchoconstriction. So a normal one is open like this. In a severe crisis, those airways just get tiny. And that's where we hear those crackles and wheezes. So our goals are going to be to open those airways and to reduce mucus. There's a couple of ways we do that in terms of methods. One is inhaled. Inhaled treatments are incredibly effective. 
They have minimal side effects, except for their major side effect is that they will pull dollars out of your bank account like nothing else horses can do. Um, so sometimes those can be tricky to use. Uh, the other options are oral treatments that we find work pretty well. Most of them are relatively reasonably priced. Um, there are a couple of options that are a little bit pricier, but nothing compared to the true inhaled steroids. So two methods to get them into the horse, inhaled or oral. In humans, inhaled treatments are the gold standard. Most people who have asthma are on an inhaler that is some combination of a bronchodilator to make a those bronchioles get bigger, and a steroid to reduce the mucus in the airways. So how do we get rid of mucus? We get rid of inflammation. Uh, steroids, like I said, are the gold standard here. The problem with steroids, as many of you may know, is that horses can develop laminitis secondary to steroid administration. We're gonna talk about that in a second, but Getting steroids into horses with asthma is a cornerstone of treatment. It's a really big deal for us. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like bute, banamine, equiox, some of those, they will occasionally help a teeny tiny little bit on a horse who has a very, very, very mild case. But these drugs just don't do a very good job shutting down the kind of inflammation that we have in the lungs that leads to asthma. So we don't really recommend it. There is some pretty decent work on omega fatty acids. And again, they're not gonna make a bad horse suddenly amazing, but they have been shown to take these horses and reduce the amount of drugs they have to get and reduce the days that they need the drugs. So they, they have been shown to help some. Um, I personally have not had that much luck with it, but I find it's one of those things that is definitely not gonna hurt and may help, so we will often try it. Um, like I said, I don't do a very good job having it work for me, but it doesn't hurt to try. Um, there are also things out there that make mucus easier to get rid of. Uh, if you guys have seen the Mucinex commercial with the big blob of mucus uh, that takes up residence in your lungs, that's a, a drug called guaifenesin, and it thins secretions and helps you cough them up because you want them out, not in. So we can give guaifenesin to horses. It has some side effects, so it's not a common drug we use. We only use it if we really, 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 really have some need to get secretions out in a hurry. Um, but there's also a lot of over-the-counter cough syrups. A lot of those contain things like menthol, um, you know, spearminty type things, and they make you feel good but they don't do a lot. They might thin the secretions a little teeny tiny bit, but not a lot. So don't rely on those to help much. Maybe, you know, as you're uh, adding things to the early stages of treatment, they might help a little bit, but they're not gonna do a whole lot for you. So opening airways. Now we're talking about bronchodilators and those come in two versions. There's the oral that we give by mouth and there's the inhaled. We also have quick acting versus long acting. So albuterol is a common drug that's given to people and that is a quick acting, but doesn't last for very long bronchodilator. It lasts for only about two or three hours. So if you would like to go out to your horse to stall every two or three hours, give them a couple puffs and then attempt to go get some work from home done, albuterol is your answer. Uh, but there are some great long acting options and those are drugs like salmeterol, uh, which is an inhaled drug and uh, clenbuterol, which is one of the oral options. We're gonna get into some of this in a minute. So steroids also help to dilate bronchioles by reducing inflammation. One of the things that happens when we have that inflammation is that the airways kind of go, ah, and they, they spasm. So by reducing inflammation, we get those spasms to go away. Uh, a lot of these are classified as what we call beta agonists, anticholinergists. There's a drug called theophylline. We like to use a lot of really big words for the bronchodilators. So um, those guys, though, for the most part, to be super effective, need to be inhaled. This is some of the myriad options available for inhaled. So up here, we have a, a product called the FlexiNab. This is really nice in that it gives you, you can put just about anything that is a liquid into it. So some of the things that we'll do is we'll take um, albuterol, which is a bronchodilator. 
We'll combine it with budesonide, which is a steroid. And then we'll add in chromalin, which is what we call a mast cell stabilizer. And mast cells from Dr. Abbott's sections are those cells that respond to allergens in the air. So they, the chromalin takes them and sort of does a Jedi mind trick on them and says there's no allergens here. So we'll put those three together, we'll put it into one of these systems and then they inhale it and it helps to act on that bronchoconstriction and the mucus. The good news is that FlexiNebs cost about $1,000. They do last for a really long time, but that's where inhaled drugs really start to add up on your pocketbook. Um, if we want to use some of the human inhaler products that are out there, we have options like the Aero Mask, and this is called the Aero Hippus. And you can attach any inhaler to those. Um, inhalers work really, really well. They are really, really, really expensive. Um, we used to be able to do some sort of finagling um, to get them from elsewhere. 2020 has ruined that, uh, like it's ruined all of our fun. But um, so inhalers are available. If you're getting them in, if you're sourcing them here, they are incredibly expensive. It's about twelve to $1,500 per week to put a horse onto inhalers uh, that we use in humans. Yeah, they're really expensive. Human inhalers. Okay, so human inhaler. Um, Retails for about 400, wholesale for us is about 399. So it's not a, they are incredibly expensive. You get um, about five days worth of doses out of one human inhaler. So they are very, very, very effective, but they are very expensive. So a lot of times we will use those liquid options. They are less effective, but a whole lot more cost effective. Um, and like I said, we can use those with the FlexiNeb there are horse adapted versions of human nebulizers. And I will say that in a pinch, I have also used human nebulizers to do horses with. And in certain cases, they work really well for me. I need a really tolerant horse, but a lot of these guys, once they learn that as that nebulizer goes in, they can breathe really well. They tolerate it fantastic. Uh, we also had a question about the new BI product, which somebody was thinking ahead. I hadn't gotten there yet. This is the new BI a Cervo inhaler. Um, it is a steroid called cyclosanide. I think I got that right. Close enough anyways. So the key to this steroid is that it is not activated until it hits the lungs. So as the horses breathe it in, it's got to get down to the lungs before it does its thing. And one of the things that we worry about with any of these steroids are the side effects of steroids. And by using inhaled ones, we can minimize those side effects. Number one side effect we worry about in horses is laminitis. And if we get up into the really high doses of steroids, laminitis certainly becomes an issue. Although I'm gonna have to find some wood to knock on. I have found it to be less of an issue in these horses than it is in my fat pasture pets that have absolutely nothing wrong with them. Uh, I don't know why, but um, you know, we use a lot of steroids on these horses. We're conservative on our doses, but when you get into the higher ones, sometimes inhalers are the only way you can go. So the, the new BI inhaler is also not cheap. Um, retail is about 300, 300. Um, it lasts for only 10 days. Uh, we haven't had enough horses on it for long enough to know how many of those we're going to need to do and if we're going to have to have horses on it repeatedly um, so that we're going to have to do, you know, 10 days and 10 days and 10 days or if these horses are going to be able to do 10 days for a period, come off of it for a while and then go back on it. So we have a lot of questions about it, but we don't really have answers. So I promise you that Tony the office cat will blog if we find answers, because that's what he's here for. That's what he does. So listen to us all day and then send out his wisdom into the world. Um, so you can look at the website, springhillequine.com, Tuesdays with Tony, to see if he drops some knowledge in the next six months or so. But we don't have great answers other than it is incredibly effective. We know on the horses that we've used it on so far that their asthma symptoms really, really, really go down to nothing pretty darn quickly. Um, I've got one horse that is on his third inhaler and his in symptoms keep coming back, but he does also have an infectious component and an IAD. So he's, he's got a lot going on, but that one's a little bit weird. So that's the inhaled solutions. Then we go to oral. 
For those of you who have one of these guys, you'll know that dexamethasone is the corner of treatment. You will also know that dexamethasone is being used quite successfully to treat severely ill COVID patients. That is making it a little bit tricky for us to get. We are able to get it on a regular basis, but we're asking everyone to keep that in mind and don't call us when you're down to your last CC because it may be tough for us to get to you on a crisis basis. So anyways, dexamethasone, most of our horses, we start on injection for when the first time we see them and then we transition them on to uh, oral doses. It's easy to give. It is fairly well tolerated for us in doses less than 20 to 24 milligrams. Uh, and the reason I said that as milligrams, not CCs or MLs, is that dexamethasone very commonly comes as two concentrations. So you need to make sure that you and your veterinarian have a conversation about what concentration you have and how much to give. And right now, in particular, we are often able to get the, the lower concentration. So we're making sure that everybody gets the correct dose for the amount of milligrams they need for the bottle we're giving you. So just be really, really, really careful about that. When we get over amounts of 20 to 24 milligrams, that's when we start to see some of the side effects. And to be honest, the side effect I see first isn't that the horses get laminitic, it's that their feet just crumble. Um, they also get what we call PUPD, which is our fancy term for they drink a lot and they pee a lot. So that's always fun when you have them in a stall. Um, but dexamethasone is incredibly effective for these horses and really shuts down the inflammation uh, while we're trying to hopefully get some other things done so that we can manage them a little bit better. Um, prednisolone is another oral steroid. Uh, for some horses, it works really well. The big advantage to it is that we have a much lower laminitis risk with prednisolone. So for some of our um, <clears throat> overweight uh, horses, we will go ahead and put them on prednisolone sometimes before we'll do dexamethasone uh, as our overweight guys are subject to a higher laminitis risk. Um, Ventipulmin is a fantastic rescue drug. It is one of those bronchodilators. And you give this orally, it's sort of a syrupy type thing. You give it orally and typically within about 30 to 45 minutes, as a bug flies in my eye, um, within 30 to 45 minutes, you have a horse who's breathing better. The problem with Ventipulmin, while it is a very effective bronchodilator, the horse is tolerized to it within 10 days. So we can only use it for about 10 days and have efficacy. So it is a drug that we recommend that most of our asthmatic owners have on the shelf. And if they have a crisis, they've got this drug to go to, but it doesn't work well as a day-to-day -day treatment. And for some horses, especially those ones who are having a particularly bad time with allergies in the environment, we can go to Zyrtec or Cetirizine. If you've been around horses long enough, you may have given them hydroxazine. Well, when you give anyone hydroxazine, including humans, the body turns it into Cetirizine. But Cetirizine is way cheaper to make. So Zyrtec is a cheap option for horses. Um, and so we will try it. I will tell you, it doesn't work on every horse. It works on enough and it's cheap enough that we try it and we see if it works. And if it doesn't, we just stop it. All right. The other option we have that works really, really well on the laminitic prone horse is acupuncture and herbal therapies. So consider those for those guys. And again, those work by reducing inflammation systemically and, uh, opening up the bronchioles. So Acupuncture and herbs, also an option. This is the fun treatment, especially for the summer pasture associated airway disease. Um, I would say that I have summer pasture airway associated disease myself. Um, and it's because of all of this fun grass pollen right here. Uh, this in Florida, this is the most common version we see. Up north, they tend to see a winter version that has to do with being locked in the barn. Um, believe it or not, the best answer for these horses is to get them in the barn in front of fans. And the reason is that it pushes the pollen out. You don't get as much pollen even in a barn and it just reduces how much they're hitting. Um, but you also want to make sure that you have as little dust as possible. So going to a low dust bedding like cardboard or hemp. Um, I have hemp in my barn and I can tell you that it has very, very, very minimal dust. 
Um, it also composts amazing, but I will not go on my hemp tirade at the moment, but I love hemp. Anyway, um, making sure that your hay is always wet. It doesn't have to necessarily be soaked for a certain amount of time. You just want to make sure that it's really wet. So this can be a five, six minute process where you just wet it all down. Make sure that dust isn't airborne. When you feed them, make sure their feed is wet down so they don't have that dust. Um, any dust is definitely going to irritate these guys. So you want to minimize your exposure to that. Um, and finally, we have allergy testing. Um, this, you're going to be in it for the long haul. So don't think that this is going to be the quick and easy answer. Uh, in Florida, we recommend it in the winter time. We want the horses to be in their least allergenic state. And the reason is they have to be off all medications for a fairly long time frame before we can do allergy testing. We do it just like they do in humans. We inject a, a small amount of allergen underneath the skin, and then we basically see how big the bump is in a few hours. Based on that, we make a vaccine that is the things that they react to worst. Um, and then you start to give that, and you start with a high volume, low concentration, and then you gradually over time go to a lower concentration or a lower volume, higher concentration, and you, you space out the time as well that way. Um, it takes a while, it takes about 12 to 18 months before we decide if it works. And the younger the horse, the better. Um, typically we have the best success in horses that are four to 20. After around 19 to 20, the immune system of horses gets a little bit like, you can't teach me anything new. I don't wanna hear what you have to say. So it's something that, especially on those younger horses, we really strongly recommend that we get them in early and we get it done. Okay, so we have some questions. And one is minis, and if we treat them any differently, minis are typically pretty prone to laminitis. So we definitely, definitely, definitely are conservative with their dexamethasone or steroid doses, period. We try to do intense, uh, environmental management with them, especially because they're down low. You want to make sure they aren't, you know, in the dust being kicked up by the other horses. You know, they aren't kind of having dust thrown on them, that kind of thing. So you want to make sure that you can manage all of the factors that you can. We're just really, really, really conservative with our dosing on things. And we try to do as many environmental things as we can. Again, those are one of those where we're going to go to acupuncture or herbs before we, we start amping up the drugs. Um, Dex and brood mares. Um, if you are a cow and you're pregnant, dexamethasone is really bad. If you're a horse, it doesn't work that way. So you can definitely do dexamethasone on pregnant horses safely within certain dose ranges. So make sure that you talk with us or your veterinarian about what the dose should be and where you are in terms of tolerance ranges. All right, question guru. How do you calculate the dosage? Zyrtec dose. Um, so the dosing on Zyrtec is one tablet per 100 pounds, and you can do that twice a day. Um, on the ones that we have that it, it actually works on, we do one tablet per 100 pounds once a day and have pretty good luck with the ones it works on. Uh, a lot of questions about moving up north. Is this moving up north. Moving up north works amazing. Now, if you're a horse up north who has trouble, moving down south works amazing. So basically a massive environment change works really, really well on these horses. Uh, and one of the reasons is that allergies have a time component to them. So by moving them up north, you're getting them to a different set of allergens. And typically in a horse lifetime, they're not there long enough to redevelop those allergies. So swapping geographic locations is an excellent plan. I did it with one of mine. She couldn't handle Florida at all. So there we go. Um, do they, are they like humans and do they react to allergy shots? Are they like humans and do they react to allergy shots? Theoretically, yes. I don't know that there's a reported case of it. So maybe, but we don't really, we haven't seen it. Can you give Zyrtec with Dex? Can you give Zyrtec with Dex? Yep, you sure can. Who would you recommend for acupuncture? Who would I recommend for acupuncture? Somebody asked who would I recommend for acupuncture? Oh, look out, here she comes, the esteemed Dr. Abbott. Oh, here we are. I, I highly recommend Dr. Abbott for acupuncture. <laughs> She's amazing. She's done my horses. There you go. Um, oh, we got to do our final giveaway, too. Yeah. Oh, one more giveaway. There we go. We got any other questions over there? 
Yes. Um, how long has this been going on? This seems like a relatively new problem. How long has asthma been going on? It seems like a relatively new problem. There's a couple of reasons why we probably see more asthma now than we have historically. And one is that horses are living to be older and older and older. And allergies um, absolutely have a time component. So that time factor is, is really huge on these guys. Um, I think we're also better at recognizing it in the early stages. You know, like uh, Dr. Abbott said, her horse wasn't necessarily showing classic signs, but was a very low level. And I think that we have gotten much better at recognizing early asthma and, and managing it. And the earlier you recognize it, the better they do. Uh, what about stem cell or hyperbaric chamber? Ooh, stem cells and hyperbaric chamber. So stem cells doesn't really work for this at all because it just doesn't seem to reduce the inflammation. Um, I know there have been some people that have tried it, but it just hasn't done what you'd like it to do, especially for the cost involved. Um, hyperbaric chamber, while it may help a horse in an acute crisis, the only way it's going to do that is that because their airways are constricted and they have a lot of mucus. All right, so anyway, hyperbaric chamber will help, but only because there is increased oxygen in the environment, like 100%. <laughs> and you've got a really tiny tube because those uh, airways are constricted going through mucus. So because there's more oxygen, those horses will feel better, but hyperbaric oxygen chambers aren't a treatment for them. They would just make them feel better in acute crisis. And in an acute case, we do tend to make sure that those horses, those horse owners have the Ventipulmin on hand. It's probably the best drug on the acute crisis. Um, if we come out, we give them some drugs like atropine. Um, we'll also give buscapan, which is a smooth muscle relaxer. And then we give a little bit of a drug called butorphanol, which um, is sort of a pain relieving type um, drug. It's a narcotic level one. And for some reason, it really helps these guys open their airways. Thank you guys for sticking it out with us. We will do our best to answer any additional questions down below in the next few days. So go ahead and put them in there and we'll work on getting them answered for you. And again, thank you for sticking it out with us. We appreciate y'all.